Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inizor Education. Um, today we continue solving different math problems, which are part of the course called Math Plus and Problems. So these problems are basically not exactly the standard math problems, which are supposed to verify whether you are um, correctly um, know the theory, so to speak. So, for instance, you have a theorem, and then you have some problems which basically illustrate that particular theorem. Now, the problems which, which I present in this course are um, a little bit of a different kind. They are supposed to uh, kind of force you to think about this problem. It's not direct implementation of theory. It's not directly related to any particular theorem as an illustration. No, you just have to find your way somehow um, to basically, you know, solve the problems, basically. So, um, some of them might be a little bit more difficult. Some of them are easier but maybe present some unusual result which you kind of don't expect. Uh, for instance, today I'm talking about um, one particular problem which I myself kind of did not expect that the result of this problem is really true. It's kind of strange looking. But anyway, it is true and I'm going to prove it. Okay, so this course, Math Plus and Problems, well, it's based on the previous prerequisite course, which is called Math for Teens, presented on the same website, unizor.com. Um, now, all the courses are totally free, there are no advertisements. If you are studying yourself, you don't even have to sign in. Sign in is for supervised um, studying, which is also totally free. Uh, also, on the same website, you have Physics for Teens and uh, for some interested people, even the course called Relativity for All, uh, where I present the theory of relativity in relatively not very uh, theoretical way. Well, it is actually. But anyway, it may be a little bit easier than some textbook. Now, what's interesting about all courses on Unizor.com, they are presented in two ways, as a lecture which you can watch and uh, every lecture has a, a textual part, description basically, which is like a chapter of a textbook. Uh, so I do suggest you always to watch the lecture and read the notes for this particular lecture, which are really side by side on the website. Also, with what is very important, problem solving is useful only if you do it yourself, basically. Now, here I present the problem and the solution, which means that you probably would be much better if you listen to the problem itself and then pause the video, do not really continue watching until you think about the problem yourself. Whether you come or, or, or you didn't with a solution, uh, then you can watch whatever I'm suggesting. Maybe it's a different solution than whatever you have, um, maybe you don't have a solution, then it would be the only one. But in any case, it's very important to think. Because the whole purpose, the whole um, idea behind this particular course is to develop in the students this ability to think, to analytically approach the problem. Okay, after this, pre <laughs> I have, uh, after this introduction, so let me just go straight to the problems. Okay, the first problem, and as I said, I did not expect this problem to be actually, uh, the result of this problem to be a, as it is presented. Okay, so here is the problem. Let's just continue uh, with a particular example. Let's cons consider a function which is depends on a uh, natural number n, which is actually, uh, well, it's 1 over 1 is 1, but it's more convenient if I will put it like this. So, as you see, I'm changing the sign every time. So, this is 1 minus 1 half plus 1 third minus 1 fourth, etc. And I am ending 
with 2 less 1. So, let me just give you an example. For n is equal to 1, so this, the end should be, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is minus. Signs are changing every time. So the last one would be one uh, minus one half. So it's one minus one half. One minus one half, which is actually one half. For n is equal to two. Oh, okay, I, I did it differently n is equal to 1 uh, colon it would be 1 1 okay right where n is equal to 2 colon 1 1 minus 1 2 plus 1 third minus 1 fourth whatever it is etc with uh, n is equal to 3 would be 1 1 minus 1 2 plus 1 3 minus 1 4 plus 1 5 minus 1 6 okay fine that's one function. Another function is you just have half of these numbers, the right half of these numbers, but only with a plus. g of n is equal to 1 n plus 1. So there are two n numbers. The first n I'm cutting off, and the right uh, side of this half, starting from n plus 1, will go, and that will be with all pluses. Okay. So for n is equal to 1, it will be 1 half. For n is equal to 2, it will be um, starting from 1 third. So it's 1 third plus 1 fourth. And for n is equal to 3, it will be 1 fourth plus 1 fifth plus 1 sixth. So, what's interesting is f of n is equal to g of n. So, sum of these uh, fractions is equal to some of these uh, fractions. And that's what we have to prove. And that's where it's good if you will pause the video and think about how to prove it. OK, now here is my solution. Well, first, by the way, I did it for n is equal to 1, 2, and 3, and basically calculated. I added these um, uh, fractions brought them to common denominator, I mean, the normal thing. And uh, it did actually confirm that this is equal. Now, obviously, it was not a proof, because I just check it for 1, 2, and 3. Now we have to basically prove it for a integer, a positive integer n. OK. Usually, if you have something like this to prove for any natural number n, the good way is to approach it using mathematical induction. So what is mathematical induction? You check it for some initial value of n. For example, for n is equal to 1. And by the way, for n is equal to 1, we have already checked it, because this would be 1, 1, minus 1, 2, which is 1, 2. And this, for n is equal to 1, would be 1, 2 only, which is equal. So we checked it for some initial value of n. Then we assume that it's true for some number n, just abstract number n, assume. And then, if using this, we will be able to prove that the next one also would be true. That would be a sufficient proof. Why? Because if I have this from this follows this and I checked it from n is equal to 1 in this particular case then I can say that okay if from n equal, if this formula is true for n 
from this follows that it, it, it's true for n plus 1. Now I checked it already for n is equal to 1, so for n is equal to 1 it's true. And therefore it would be for n plus 1, which is 2. Okay, so now basically using this particular logic, I can say that if, if it's true for n is equal to 1, then it's true for n is equal to 2. Great, I've proven it for 2. Now, but since I have already proven it for 2, I can say then, using the same logic, it's true for 3, etc. So basically for any n, I can sequentially uh, make this type of logical um, connection and go to million or billion or whatever number of n, which basically means that we have proven it for any n. Okay, so how can we prove that from this follows this? So for n is equal to 1 we have already gotten, right? So let's just try to prove this particular um, uh, logic. Now, what is the difference between fn and f and f, f of n and f of n plus 1. Well, I'm adding two more numbers. f of n plus 1 is equal to f of n. And then two more numbers, which is uh, plus 1 over 2n plus 1 minus 1 over 2n plus 2. So if I will put n plus 1 into this, I have to finish with 2n plus 2, right? So two next member would be plus 2n plus 1, and the next one would be 2 plus 2, 2n plus 2, with a minus sign. Okay, fine. Now, the g of n plus 1 would be g of n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 plus 1 over 2n plus 2 but we have to get rid of this because it's supposed to be only half of these numbers right so if i start from 2n plus 2 then i mean if i end 2n plus 2 i should start i should cut one of them because it's only half half of this would be n plus 1 so n plus 1 i should cut off so starting from n plus 2 so i should really minus 1 over n plus 1 Okay, now, if I assume that these two are equal, how can I prove that these two are equal? Well, let's just compare whatever we have extra, extra here and extra here. If I will prove that two, uh, 1 over 2 uh, m plus 1 minus 1 over 2 plus 2 is equal to this, then basically my theorem is proven. From equality of this, I have proven equality of these two, but just by basically comparing the extras, right? So this extra we can call f lowercase f plus one, and this one we have n g of n plus one. Okay. So we have to basically prove that f of n plus 1 is equal to g of n plus 1. Now, how can this type of thing will be, how, how can prove this? Well, very simply, just get the common denominator, multiply them one by one by one, put whatever the necessary uh, is in the numerator, just do the calculations basically, and see if if it's e actually equal. Now, I'm, I've done this calculation in the textual part of this lecture. I don't want to spend, it's a trivial kind of thing, so I don't want to spend any time. You just have to trust me, or you have to check it yourself. Now, I do recommend you to check it yourself, that some of these, this plus this minus this, if you will get it to common denominator and have the numerator completely uh, open all the parentheses, etc., you will have exactly the same as this one. Because here we have three different uh, multiplier in the denominator, 20 plus 1, 20 plus 2, and n plus 1. Here we have only two. But whenever we will just bring 
whatever is necessary to numerator and add them up, you will have in the numerator n plus 1. So n plus 1 would cancel this, and you will have exactly the same as this. So, I'm not going to do it. You do it yourself, and you can check your calculations. I mean, it, it, it is equal. So if you do not get the equality, then something is wrong with your calculations. So, yes, they are equal, and that's why uh, we can conclude that from this follows this. And again, using this mathematical induction logic, since I have already checked it from n, equal one, n is equal to 1, then it follows that this is true for this, this formula. This formula is true for n is equal to 2. From 2 is equal to 3 is following, etc., etc. So we have proven it for every n. So it's a good illustration of method. <coughs> sorry, method of mathematical induction, obviously. But again, it's kind of unusual result. I never expected, quite frankly, myself that this would be equal to this. Well, it is what it is. Next problem. Next problem is also kind of illustration of something which you know about quadratic functions. But the illustration is a little bit more vivid. It's kind of physical, so to speak. Let's consider you have two perpendicular roads. And you have two cars approaching the intersection. Now, at moment t is equal to 0, one car is on a distance a from intersection and goes towards another car is on, on the distance b and goes towards intersection. And let's just assume that a is not equal to b for a simple reason, we don't want any collisions because they are moving with the same speed b. Okay, so this is the condition. Now, obviously when they are approaching this uh, distance is changing uh, now at certain time it all depends on a and b and the speed obviously this distance um, should have some minimal minimum value um, because they are not at the same time at the intersection so the question is when exactly this minimum value will be. Well, um, to do this, we will just have to calculate the distance between them as a function of time. Now, what's the distance, let's call it um, a of t at the moment t? a of t is equal to a minus speed times time, right? If this is speed, this is the initial distance, and every second we are reducing distance by, by, by v. Now, the b of time would be b minus vt. Speed is the same. Now, what's the distance between them? Well, if I know these two, this is a of t, this is b of t, this is hypotenuse, so the distance square of t is equal to a square of t plus b square of t, which is equal to let me just get another. So this is equal to a minus vt square plus b minus vt square. This is square of a distance. Now, we have to minimize it. Now, well, we have to minimize the distance, not the square of a distance, but 
the diff there is not the, uh, they are making actually this minimum value at the same time so whenever the distance is minimized the square of the distance is minimized as well obviously so when this is minimized so we need to find function uh, we need to find time which I call t minimum when this thing this d square of t whenever it takes a minimum value well this is a quadratic function so it's basically a parabola right so we know how to calculate the minimum value so when it's minimum and what exactly the minimum is, is itself okay uh, in case you have a parabola something like p x squared plus q x plus r y is equal now when this parabola takes the minimum value when x is equal to minus q divided by 2p this is definitely a known fact if you forgot about this you can check the uh, the course which is prerequisite for this one mass for teens uh, whenever the quadratic function is explained it's very easy to prove basically it's supposed to be in between two uh, roots uh, of this two intersections with x uh, right in between so that's what you will have and the value minimum value would be if you substitute instead of x into this formula you substitute this one and you will have the minimum value all right so we will do the same thing but we have to really bring it into this type of um, form so what is coefficient at t square now coefficient of t square would be b square and another b square when we will open the parentheses, right? So it would be 2 v square t square. This is my d square of t. Now, what is the coefficient at v? Minus 2 a v t and minus b, 2 b v a t. So it would be minus 2 a plus b v t. And the free member, the r, would be a square plus b square. from which we conclude that this particular thing so instead of x we have t instead of q we have we have this this is q and instead of p we have this this is p so minus q which is 2 a plus b b divided by 2 pi, so it's 2p, so it's 2, 4 v square. So we have this 2, this, and we have a plus b divided by v, 2v. And this is t minimum. So at this particular moment in time, the distance between them would be minimal. Okay, so we found the time. How about the value? Well, to find the value, we just have to substitute this thing into this and see what will be. And take the square root, obviously. So let's see what happens. So, v times t is t minimum, is a plus b over 2. Okay, so if we will substitute with the a minus a plus b over 2 square, plus b minus a plus b minus divided by square. 
So that's my d square minimum equals. So it's no longer a function of time, of t. It's just plain constant, which depends only on initial position in So what will that be? It's 2a minus a minus b, so it's a minus b squared divided by 2 plus 2b minus, so it would be b minus a squared divided by 2, which is equal to a minus b squared and b minus a minus b and b minus a. When it's square, it's the same thing, so we can say a minus b squared divided by 2. So my d minimum equals square root of this, which is a minus b absolute value divided by square root of 2. And that's the result. So this would be the minimum distance. As they are moving, the minimum distance would be this. So, um, by the way, if a is equal to b, they will reach the same at the same point intersection. Well, there would be a collision, but that's when we will have distance between them equal to zero. Otherwise, the distance would not be equal, minimum distance would not be equal to zero. Okay, that's it. Uh, I suggest you to read the notes for this lecture, and again, if you can, don't look at the answer or a solution, whatever is in the textual part of this lecture. Do it yourself first. If you can, great. If you cannot, well, then read the solution and basically learn from it. So next time it might be easier for you. That's it for today. Thank you very much and good luck.